Last week, we, I've, I've, noticed, I've noticed over the course of the last few you know, uh, sermons and the last few messages, you know, upwards even of a few months, um, it seems like there's a thread of obedience and uh, that's pretty awesome. So, you know, last week, uh, Nathan did an awesome job, awesome, awesome job last week on uh, deliberate obedience, uh, gave me a lot of things to chew on all week, um, and that's awesome. It is so awesome. So uh, when I was thinking about some of the stuff that was said, I asked the Lord, you know, I was just pondering on it and, and just going, Lord, what do you think about all this? And and I'm pretty sure I hold the I heard the Holy Spirit. Um, I hope it was the Holy Spirit. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit. And He said He gave me a couple of statements that I'm still processing. And uh, the first thing that He told me, He said, uh, "To be obedient, adjustments are necessary." And uh, I'm still working on that. He gave me a whole bunch of examples, uh, examples of my own life, um, just so many different things. He said to be obedient. Adjustments are necessary. And so, as I'm thinking about that, adjustments are necessary to be obedient. Um, adjustments are necessary to be obedient. I'm just going over it, over it, over it, trying to figure it all out. And then, uh, in the midst of trying to figure it all out, I heard again that uh, the Lord, he said, he said, I, he said, me, he said, you cannot stay where you are and go with me at the same time. That I'm like, huh, well, I thought I was doing good just sitting right here. I mean, what, what do you mean? I, I can't stay where I'm at and go with him at the same time. And so I'm, I'm catching all these little statements. The first one was to be obedient. Adjustments are necessary. Um, the second one was to go with him. I can't stay where I am. I can't stay stationary. I have to continue moving. And... Uh, and then in the midst of thinking about those two things, uh, over the course of several days, that's when I finally heard him say that. He said, absolute surrender is required. And I don't know about y'all, but that's a tough pill for me to swallow. Because, uh, again, just the, the word surrender doesn't fit in my vocabulary. Um, fight does. Argue, disagree, toil, wrestle. All of those things fit in my vocabulary. Surrender is not one. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on getting a new word added to my vocabulary called surrender. On top of that, he put the emphasis on his absolute, absolute surrender. And, uh, you know, I, be, I enter into this discussion with, with the Lord throughout the week. And, uh, and he shows me areas that I haven't totally surrendered to him. And I argue with him because I've given him partial surrender all over the place, just not complete. And uh, uh, even in, I've been doing a study for, for eight weeks. It's about 35 to 45 minutes a day, five, six days a week, actually five days a week, and then we meet collectively as a group. And so we're, we're several, you know, 40 plus days into this, into this study. And I, I begin to see a theme in that. The theme is that, I don't really trust God, and uh, and that that's. I mean, I like to stand up here and go, "Yeah, I got it all together. I trust you. It's perfect." You know, <laughs> what we say and what we do sometimes are totally different. You know, actions reveal what our truths are. Um, you know, faith without works is dead type thing. You know, I say that I trust Him wholeheartedly, um, but then He asks me to release something and I can't. Actually, it's not that I can't, it's that I won't. Or he asks me to walk away from something, and I won't. Or I, there, there's just tons and tons and tons of different things. He asks me to let him deal with things, and I won't, because I think that I can do it better. He asks me to not talk about certain things, and I do. And he asks me to talk about certain things, and I don't. And it's crazy, it's crazy. I, I mean, I, you know, I know I'm up here kind of joking around, but even as I'm saying it, I feel ashamed. You know, this the the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the brethren. You know, um, Satan and and even his 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 minions are constantly picking up on our faults, and then 
accusing us before God and then even accusing us before ourselves on how, um, you know, we shouldn't be doing ABC. I, I, I shouldn't, according, you know, I know what's in me. You guys don't. Thank you, Lord. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lord. But, I mean, I, I feel like I shouldn't even be up here talking. You know what I mean? The, 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 the shame and the condemnation that comes with disobedience or not fully trusting or being partially obedient, it's catastrophic not only to me but to people around me. And the same I'd like to think, I'm pretty sure it goes for y'all, you know, when, when you guys are obedient to, to the things that the Lord shares with you, then it's not just a blessing for you guys, it's a blessing for everybody around you. And when, you know, vice versa, you know, when you're disobedient, you know, it not only affects you, it affects everybody around you. And, man, Lord, I just ask that you would forgive me for pride for arrogance, for thinking I know, for disobedience, ultimately, for rebellion, for your word, Lord. It says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And we know that witchcraft is just control. And so, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me for not fully trusting you. And I ask that you would help me with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Huh. Wow. <laughs> this is way more difficult than I envisioned it for some reason. Um. So I heard the Holy Spirit, you know, to be obedient, adjustments are necessary. And he's even just taken me through in the last couple of weeks, have showed me where I don't trust him fully. Um, <laughs> this is all right. It's, uh, this isn't what I want to share, <laughs> but that's okay. It's, uh, you know, the Lord over the course of the last couple of weeks, he showed me my own heart. And uh, it all started with learning about Lashon hara, and I know that you guys maybe don't understand what that is. That's that's a Hebrew word uh, for slander in the Old Testament, and uh, and a lot of times when you have inner turmoil within your hearts, or or you think that you know better than your brothers or your sisters, we will at times not you guys, I know, but just me. At times we'll have evil intents or evil thoughts, or I know better than them. How could they do this? How could they not see it my way? Or we roll through these things internally. And actually in the Old Testament, um, you know, the Lord would reveal it's a hidden sin that nobody knows about. And the Lord would reveal, uh, uh, he would reveal people's hearts to the community as a whole through what we call as leprosy. And, and it really isn't even leprosy. <laughs> It's just a skin disease, but God in his grace would send the people outside of the camp for seven days, and if they would have a change of heart, he would allow them to come back. You know, the priest would examine them, would send them out of the camp for seven days, and then at the end of seven days, the priest would go and re-examine them. And if they had had a change of heart, the skin disease would begin to clear up, and they would allow to be come back to the community. Okay? <laughs> the Lord started showing me in my heart some areas, and uh, <laughs> and he told me that, uh, that I have a problem submitting to authority. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, what, how do you argue when the Lord shares something with you? You know what I'm saying? I mean, what do you say to that? No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, and, uh, and the Lord started taking me through he, he's awesome. He's so awesome. He took me back to when I was a little kid and showed me broken trust between my father and myself. And he showed me previous employers. And he's shown me football coaches. And uh, he's shown me previous leaders that I've sat under. And he's shown me where all of these little broken trusts happen. And because I had all these broken trusts, I began to depend upon myself. And, and so the Lord would ask me to surrender. I mean, we might as well throw these in the trash. <laughs> the, the, Lord, uh, the Lord asked me to submit. And, and I did with a horrible attitude. I mean, I did the things that were required of me. But I moaned and groaned and complained and grumbled underneath of my voice. Um... And, and he started telling me some things, making some statements to me. He said, you know, it's, you can be 100% right, but totally wrong. And I'm like, excuse me? 
How's that even compute? You can be 100% right, but totally wrong. And he says, he started sharing with me. He said, I've revealed things to you that are absolute truths, but the way you go about sharing it is wrong. <laughs> and uh, he says, so when, when I asked you to submit, your actions did one thing, but the grumbling within yourself says something totally different. And he knows our hearts. You know what I'm saying? So I might have all of y'all full, fooled with my actions, but God knows our hearts. You know, he's a righteous judge. He, he doesn't judge by the appearance. He doesn't judge by the things that he sees. He knows the intents of our heart. He knows our thoughts. And, uh, you know, he kind of took me through this journey and in, in, in showing me that... Uh, <laughs> he's, oh man, he's just told me so much stuff over the last couple weeks. He asked me to believe in, in people, believe in people. And I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I know myself, I really don't know about other people, but if, I, if I'm as bad as I think I am, I definitely don't want to believe in other people. And he started getting me, you know. The Lord lays things in your path, in your life, over the course of a period of time that gets you ready for these conversations. He allows you to have successes and failures. And so as he's sharing my heart with me, it's, it's confusing. It's catastrophic, first of all, because I think I'm better than that. And, and then um, it's humbling at the same time because he really does know what we think and he really does know what we feel. And, uh, and he puts us on the spot. He puts me on the spot. He causes me, he doesn't do anything first and foremost. I want you to totally understand that he's a gentleman. Um, but he holds us to our words. And he says, you know, I say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. God, Father, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And he goes, well, if I'm the Lord of your life, then what about A, B, C, D? Because that's where you're still lording. You have not released control to me. You have not submitted to me this area. You did great in all these other areas, but this area, you're not doing so great at. It reminds me of the churches in Revelations. You know, they did so much stuff good, but, but, but. So the Lord asked me to trust in the people that he's placed around me. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I don't know what the people around me are going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I trust in myself. And he goes, uh, he, he told me, he said, when you can't receive from your own church, it says more about what you believe about me than what you believe in the church. And he really started putting me on the spot. And he said, if you believe that, they, that my spirit is in them, if my spirit is in everybody in here, then I could receive from them. And if I can't receive in them, that means I don't really trust that God loves them, God loves me, God has our best interest at heart, his will is perfect. And so, <laughs> I've had to go to a handful of brothers and ask them to forgive me. And I thought I had it squared away just with that. <laughs> and uh, I found myself just this Friday night in a, in a meeting and was sharing, we were all collectively sharing, and uh, me and a brother were sharing some similar circumstances, and, um, and push, I don't want to say push came to shove, but we were both getting just a little bit passionate. <laughs> and, uh, and after, you know, it was all fine and dandy, well, then we left, and when we left, the Lord said, you see that? And I said, see what? And he's like, you see that pride and that arrogance. <laughs> Why couldn't you let them be right? Why do you have to argue? Why do you have to dig in? Why can't you trust me that the people that I put around you are for your good? Don't you know that love is selfless? I mean, I don't know about y'all. I mean, I love the Lord, but he has some really difficult discussions with me sometimes. They're probably not hard for him, but they're difficult for me. <laughs> um, and so I'm still working some things out, and he keeps telling me that absolute, absolute surrender is required and then, uh, you know, I visited with my wife about some of the facts of the story, and then I had to reach out to the brother and again ask him to forgive me. Regardless of how the facts came or how they didn't come, I had to ask him to forgive me, one, for lying, 
two for pride, and three for arrogance. And that is just, it's not fun. (laughs) But I do know that the Lord is revealing some things in me because as we all walk closer with him, um, the leash gets shorter. (laughs) Not that I'm on a leash at all. But when you come into the presence of the Father, things are going to come off of you and things are going to come out of you. It's, it's, <laughs> and it isn't always pretty. It isn't always pretty when we're going through things. And, and I look up to so many of you guys in here. Um, it's just so humbling how he never gives up on us and how he continually presses new wine, and how he continually crushes us. Now I'll try to get back to my notes. <laughs> uh, he's telling me to, we have to come, I have to come to a place of absolute surrender. That is required in order for me to continue moving forward with him. I can no longer stay in a place of giving pieces of my life to the Father, but not all of it. Um, so... <laughs> I thought maybe I was hoping really that uh, he meant to say partial surrender, <laughs> but that wasn't it. He, he definitely said absolute, total surrender. And then he took me through a quick run, a uh, quick run through the Bible. You guys don't have to turn here. You can because we're going to roll through them pretty quick. In Genesis chapter 6, Noah could not continue life as usual and build the ark. He couldn't stay where he was and accomplish what the Lord had for him. Some adjustments were necessary. Um, In Genesis 12, Abram couldn't stay in Ur or Haran and father the nation in Canaan. He couldn't. You know what I mean? Adjustments were necessary. The Lord made a statement to him, and they had to surrender everything. They had to make adjustments. In Exodus 3, Moses couldn't stay on the backside of the desert herding sheep and stand before Pharaoh. I mean, how could he be in two places at one time? So adjustments were necessary. You know, in 1 Samuel 16, David had to leave the sheep that he was shepherding to become king. He couldn't stay and be a shepherd's boy, or be a shepherd's, a herd shepherd, and be the king. Um, In the book of Amos, he he had to leave. Uh, He was, he tended blows me away. He tended fig trees, but it says sycamore fig trees. I can't even fathom a sycamore fig tree because I know what a sycamore tree is. But he says that uh, he had to leave tending his sycamore fig trees to preach in Israel. He couldn't stay there and mess with his tending his trees, or maybe we could say crops because we're in the Midwest, (laughs) and go and deliver words to Israel. You know, Jonah in several spots, Um, You know, he had to leave his home, and he had to overcome a major disagreement with the Lord in order to preach to Nineveh. I can so relate. I've never, ever been able to relate to Jonah like I have here lately. Because the Lord says something to me, and I argue. (laughs) He's like, go do this, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) And he goes, you sound like you're teenagers, or you're (laughs) young He says, go do this, and, uh, and I'm like, no, I'm, not, I'm just not doing it, because I know your character, and you're not going to do what you say you're going to do. You, you are a righteous judge, but you're full of mercy, and before you bring the righteous judgment, you always give out the chance for mercy, and when you want to deal righteous judgment, I'm your man, and when you want to do mercy, send my wife, and uh, uh, right, and so... Um, Anywho, I've never been able to relate to Jonah as much as I have recently. Um, In Matthew, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they all had to leave their fishing business to follow Jesus. He asked for absolute surrender. He asked them to make changes in their lives to continue walking with them. Um, In Matthew 9, you know, um, I'm having a brain fart. What's the the tax collector's name? (laughs) Matthew, this is great. I'm up here thinking Zacchaeus for some reason, dropping out of a tree. Anyway, Matthew had to leave his tax booth to follow Jesus. He could not continue to be a tax collector and follow Jesus. 
Um, in Acts, you know, Saul later became Paul. He had to completely change directions, the direction in which he thought he was going. If he wanted to do what the Lord had, do what the Lord had called him to do, if he was going to preach the gospel to Gentiles, he had to change his entire life. And all of these men had to make major, major adjustments in order to be obedient to God. And uh, we all know that God desires obedience over sacrifice, right? What's wild is the two intertwine. You know what I'm saying is obedience is the sacrifice. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm wrong. It is for me anyway. At least that's what it seems like. Um, so some of these guys, they had to leave their family. They had to leave their country. Uh, they had to change their values. Uh, they had to leave behind life goals, ideas, desires, I mean, to surrender all to the Father. I like to think that I have understand what I'm saying, but really he's having me live it out. And while it sounds cool, it is cool. It is so scary. For me, maybe not for y'all, but for me it is scary to trust my heavenly Father when my earthly Father broke that. And so like what I have to rely on or what I have to depend on God's love for me, the only thing that I have to, to, to gauge that is a broken relationship. And if I have that broken relationship here on earth, is the same thing going to happen with my heavenly father? Of course it isn't. But convince yourself that. For me to try to convince my mind that God's not going to break me, when really all he wants to do is break me, it's so tricky. You know what I'm saying? In total brokenness and total submission, in my weakness, he is strong. You know what I'm saying? I, I, we know these scriptures, you know, but to live them out is wild. Um, so the moment these guys uh, made the necessary changes, and I put myself there, the moment I make necessary changes in order to walk with the Father, then he begins to accomplish uh, his plans. Then he begins to accomplish his purposes. Then he begins to advance his kingdom, not just through me, but with me. That's something else the Lord's teaching me right now is that uh, I want to go to the king, get my marching orders, and then I want to go do it without him. And he's like, that's not how it works in my kingdom. You can come and get your marching orders, but we're going to do it together. And in fact, you're going to take a backseat role and let me do it through you. And I'm like, what? Well, where's the glory in that? And he's like, exactly. It's not yours. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, all of us, every one of us, I, I do believe this, all of us are going to learn that when we adjust our lives to him, it'll be well worth the cost. I think all of us have had little breakthroughs, um, you know, where at the time something was really difficult, but then on the backside of it, we were like, man, I didn't see it then, but I see it now. God, you're so amazing. You know, he, he knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything. He knows, it, it blows me away if you think about it. Out of all the different choices that all of us could make, he knows all of that. And he knows how to somehow make my wrong choice flow with your right choice. Or your right choice to flow with my, however, you get what I'm saying. Uh... I put a bunch of stars by this statement, and out of all of this, this is the most impactful one for me. It says, you see, one of our greatest difficulties in walking with the Lord will come at the point of absolute surrender. One of the greatest difficulties in me walking with God will come at the point of absolute surrender. He's going to ask me to give something to him. Um, there was a time where... I had to give my marriage to him. And I broke it beyond repair. I couldn't fix it. And, and my wife had all she could handle, and so she took our two boys and moved halfway across the country. And we were separated for a year. And that was the first, I mean, when she left, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, I could believe it, but I couldn't believe it. <laughs> that she finally did what she said she was going to do. And it wasn't too long after she left, I hung on to a partial scripture. James 4.2 says, You have not because you ask not. 
That's the first part of the scripture. There's another part that says you don't have the things you ask for because your motives are wrong. But I didn't read that part. I just held on to the first part. I have not because I asked not. So I started asking God for my, my family back. And, uh, and I asked him a lot. And it was when everything was totally gone, it was not going to happen. Um, <laughs> it was not going to happen. I, I finally had swallowed that hard pill that I've ruined um, my wife. It was, she wasn't, I don't think. Yeah, she was. I, my wife had left. I thought it was over, and I came to a place. I actually wasn't even divorced yet and was on a date with a girl at Applebee's in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's how I came. That's how you know that it's over. You know what I'm saying? When you start trying to move on. And Susie called me and asked if, you know, she gave me some bad news um, about our son and then asked if we could work some things out. But it was at the place of total surrender that God was able to move. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when, when, first of all, you know, I thought I had control of it, over it. And when I tried to control it, I just made a mess out of it. I had no idea how to be a husband, no idea how to be a father. I made all these empty promises to my, the love of my life on everything I was going to do for her. And I underdelivered on every single one of them. It was in total shambles. And it was a miracle of God. But it was only when I completely let go of it and walked away and gave him time to move. I didn't give him time, first of all. <laughs> he made a way. Um, but I didn't know that in that year that we were separated, he was doing things in her and in me. And it was bringing it all back together, but I had to come to a place of total surrender um, in order for him to move. So we, we have... We have Choices to make when we get to that bridge or when we get to that crossroads of difficult seasons and difficult situations and circumstances and, you know, difficult relationships even where we'll have to come to a place of absolute and total surrender. And it's those are make or break moments, you know, when uh, if I would have kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on, I would have just made the situation worse. But when I was able to get my hands off of it, the Lord fixed it. So a lot of times, uh, we tend to want to skip making the necessary adjustments required for obedience. I'm going to give you guys these three statements, and then we'll kind of go back through them just briefly. The one, that first one, we tend to want to skip making the necessary adjustments required for obedience. A lot of times, we want to go straight from believing what God said to obedience, and I'm actually in the process of living this out. I know, I know, I know, I know that I heard the voice of the Lord, and I'm going to go straight to obedience, but I skipped the adjustments that are going to help me to carry what he asked of me. You get what I'm saying? So we don't fully understand that it's the necessary adjustments that are required for the obedience. You know, I want to go straight to obey. And I got a couple of examples here. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, David was anointed king, but he adjusted for 15 years. Some say 15, some say 16. So I got 15 slash 16 years before he became the king, you know? Samuel showed up and poured oil all over him and said, you were anointed king. And then he had to, then the Lord developed him for 15 to 16 years before he took that position. You know, uh, Genesis 37, Joseph had a dream that his whole family would come and bow before him when he was 17 years old. And that so reminds me of me. It so reminds me of me. I, I trust so much in my relationship with the Lord that I heard his voice and I will stomp all over everybody around me to achieve what he showed me. And unfortunately, that breaks a lot of people. It's like walking through a garden. Like, have you ever stepped on a tulip? Or, you know when your tomato, right now, my tomato plants, I got some tomato plants growing and I got the cages around them, and they're going all over. And I go out there, and I try to get the, get the branch that's underneath of the cage, and I try to pick it up to go up to the next cage, and it snaps. Have you ever seen that or done that? Anybody that messes with gardens? I'm not a gardener. I've broken a lot of them here lately. Well, Joseph had this dream that his family would bow down before him, and he adjusted 
for it said almost 14 years before it came to pass. He had to make the required adjustments before he could actually be obedient. And I can't tell you, again, how many times I've messed that up. This is what the Lord showed me. This is where he's going. I'm gone. And I destroy tons of people in the midst because I didn't allow him to roll me through a process of understanding, of softening my heart, of how to carry the things he's asking me to carry, how to deliver it properly so that it's not offensive. That's one of my big struggles. <laughs> if you ever need anybody to offend somebody, you let me know. I'm your guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the necessary adjustments set them up in a place of absolute surrender so they could actually be obedient. It was only when they came to the place of total surrender. I think about how many times, you know what I mean, David had to run from, from Saul as he was trying to kill him, and he lived in a cave, and he had all these opportunities actually to kill the king, but he didn't. i got to tell you, I would probably killed him. Like, whoop, there's my opportunity. You're dead. Now I'm the king. Yay! You know what I mean? I, 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 you know, Joseph was arrogant. He did it once and didn't get it. You know what? Y'all are going to, I'm going to have the robe. Y'all are going to bow down to me. <laughs> he didn't do it once. He did it twice. That gives me a little hope. <laughs> and he had to sit in the dungeon. You know what I mean? and interpret some dreams, and go through things, and, and be the second in command. And then Potiphar's wife, you know, she made these crazy accusations against him. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> as if he wasn't humbled enough already. He had to get, make sure that he was humbled. So uh, I want to look at a couple of contrasting stories of absolute surrender, okay? So the first one is going to be, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 21. Um, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is the story, or this is the beginning. This is kind of the beginning of the transference of Elijah to Elisha. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15. Oh, I'm sorry, verses 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. It says, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field with teams of oxen. There were eleven teams of oxen ahead of him, and he was plowing with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but consider what I have done to you. Elisha then returned to his oxen. He killed them, and he used the wood from the plow to build a fire and roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the other plowmen, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So I'll paraphrase here. This is the Lord. Um, this will be Scott's interpretation. I hope that it would kind of maybe line up with yours. The Lord is anointing Elisha here for service. You know what I'm saying? But he was going to have to follow Elijah and learn some things. And so the Lord calls Elisha, and these are the things that he does. You know what I mean? He takes the plows off of the 11. For some reason, I thought it was. Oh, because he was the 12th. Okay, gotcha. So Elisha, he took the, you know, took the, the yokes off made a fire out of them, slaughtered the animals, cooked them, and then fed a bunch of people with them, and then followed the Lord. What adjustment did he make? He walked away from everything. Okay, now let's take a look at Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. This is a story of the rich young ruler. It says, uh, it says, once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to get eternal life? 
I've never read it, religious leader. In the King James, it says, a certain ruler asked him, but we'll stick with the New Living Translation. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to enter, to get eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But as for your question, you know the commandments. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do, do not testify falsely. Honor your mother and father. The man replied, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was a child. There is still one thing you lack, Jesus said. Sell all that you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the man heard this, he became sad because he was very rich. <clears throat> 24 is Jesus watched him go and then said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich people to get into the kingdom of God. 25, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so I want you guys to remember those two stories if you can. First one, we'll go over the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, he desired eternal life, but he didn't want to make the necessary adjustments to follow Jesus. I know it wouldn't... Okay, maybe it's me. <laughs> we'll just use me. <laughs> Oh my, how I say, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. God, you are the Lord of my life. Lord, I've made a mess of myself, and I want you to save my soul. <clears throat> I want eternal life with you, Father. And he goes, well, just say the prayer. Not exactly. <laughs> he says, if you believe in him, <laughs> if I believe in Jesus, if I believe in Yeshua, then I will be saved. Believing in him and saying the prayer are a little different. Just, just a thought. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> Again, that's just me. So he considered his money and his wealth to be most important. But Jesus knew that people cannot love God completely and love money. He makes this statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. You know, you cannot serve God and money. You will love one and hate the other or hold the one and despise the other. You guys follow me? So Jesus asked him to put away what had become his God, which was his wealth. And the young ruler refused to change his priorities and who he missed out on eternal life. See, faith without works is dead. When the Lord asks you to do something, if you don't make an action, <laughs> it'll cost you. It'll cost you. Um, the young ruler's love of money and greed made him a idolater, you know, idol worship. And so I can, I can see in this guy's story, you know, his money, but I can see in um, not anybody else's life, just my life. I can see where I've made my kids number one, my, knife, my wife number one, my hunting number one, my job number one, everything. My pride, my ego, my arrogance number one. I've put so many things before Christ. <clears throat> Ephesians 5 5 says, Of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater and doesn't have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. <laughs> we got to be careful with what we put as number one because he's going to ask for absolute surrender. The rich young ruler missed coming to know God and Jesus, whom God sent. He wanted to gain eternal life, but he refused to do what was necessary to obtain it. God is so awesome. You know, he gives us salvation. He gives us Jesus. He gives us the blood of Christ. You know, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I'm so grateful for that. You know what I'm saying? It's after salvation that we become, uh, after salvation that we get the opportunity to conform to the image of Christ. I know that once you're saved, you're a new creation. But I promise out of our actions, we don't fully understand that. If we fully understood and walked as a new creation that Christ died for, we wouldn't do and live the way that sometimes we live and do the things that we do. You get what I'm saying? <clears throat> Salvation is free. 
It's a free gift. Nothing, I couldn't earn that. You guys couldn't earn that. Um, you know, however, the Lord says, be holy because I'm holy. It begins a lifelong process of transformation. And he already did it for us. We already have it. But it takes, you know, what came up today, you know, Romans 12, 2 is be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will know the perfect, acceptable will of the world. Perfect, acceptable will of the Father. It's only in renewing our mind to his word. It's only renewing our mind to his truths that we're no longer conformed to this world. I wish that I was saved and then I wasn't conformed to this world anymore, but that's just not the way that the Lord set it up. <laughs> it's, it's not about doing and earning, but it is about faith with action. Faith with action. So Elisha responded much differently. He left his family and his career, which was farming, to follow God's call. He killed his oxen. He used their plowing equipment for firewood. He cooked them. He gave it to the people, and he wholeheartedly followed Elijah. I put in parentheses the Lord, because even when I read that story, that's a difficult pill for me to swallow. If I mean, I guess it was probably a smaller world then. You know what I mean? So he probably knew that Elijah was the prophet. That's just assumption. I don't know if he knew that Elijah was a prophet or not, but if some dude, if, if Rod walked up to me and threw his cloak on me and told me to follow him, I don't know what if I would do that, let alone kill my way of living. You get what I'm saying? I mean, these guys just had a different faith, I guess, than, no, they didn't. Lord, help me. Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, help build up my faith. Uh, anyway, um, when Elisha had made the necessary adjustments, then he was in a position to obey God. It's all about positioning. I mean, it's not all about positioning, but for this context it is. <laughs> if we don't position ourselves and make the necessary adjustments to walk with the Father, how can we ever obey him? We all, uh, no, no, no. I want to be the superstar, but I can't even run the broom. You know, it's through all of these minor adjustments over the course of time that we actually get the opportunity to be obedient with the bigger things. So uh, as a result of Elisha making the necessary adjustments, um, he worked through Elisha actually to perform some of the greatest miracles recorded in the Old Testament. Uh, best I could come up with was that he had, he had recorded 14 total miracles. I wrote a couple of them down. He split the Jordan River. Um, he healed the bitter water. Um, you know, the, you guys are probably familiar with the widow's oil. She only had just enough for herself and just a little bit of flour for bread, and, and, and he kept that going and going and going. This one, I, I had to put this in there because I really loved it, even though it might not be a miracle. It depends on who, what side you look at it from. So there were these 42 little kids. There was these kids that were giving Elisha a hard time because he was bald. And so he calls forth a couple of bears, and these he cursed them. I don't know if that's a miracle, but he cursed these little kids, and two bears came and killed 42 of these little turd balls. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do you ever feel like that? Like, ooh, your parents should have spanked you a long time ago. But anyway, they count that as a miracle. I think it's hilarious. I don't know, you know, I bet them kids' as parents didn't think it was a miracle. <laughs> or maybe they did. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, Elisha had to make major adjustments on the front end of his call. And it was only after the necessary adjustments were made um, that God began to work through him to accomplish God's will. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, once we were servants to sin, and now we are servants to the Almighty. You know what I mean? Um, I'm still working on that. Again, you know, I received salvation because I wanted to go to heaven, not because I wanted to serve God. But now he has me serving him, and it gets easier and easier and easier. <laughs> he's, he's like master at, like, giving you what you want to get what he wants. <laughs> it's uh, Maybe we would call that a vow, um, and we just nonchalantly throw things out there, and he holds us to them. He comes for those words, I'm telling you. Whether we write them down or we just nonchalantly say them, he knocks, taps me and goes, hey, you remember what you said back there? And I'm like, I do. And he goes, I'm here to collect. And I'm like, you are. <laughs> so uh, 
Our Father frequently requires adjustments in areas of our lives that we have never considered or even been open to in the past. You know, this whole thing with the Lord showing me that I had a problem with, uh, with submitting to authority, I would have never believed that, not in a million years. But over the course of time, uh, he's allowed little things to happen, little uh, inconsistencies in my walk with the Father. And uh, I was at a, at a group and uh, getting some prayer, and, and this guy, you know, he made a statement that really resonated with me. And I thought about it, and as I was driving home, he sent this thing. He sent this thing, it was a teaching by um, John Bevere called uh, Undercover. And he sent it to me, and he said, I would really encourage you to take a look at this. It was 12, 30-minute segments, so it was six hours. And he sent it to me, and as soon as I seen John Bevere, I wanted to throw it in the trash. I'm not a big John Bevere fan, but that's okay. John Bevere didn't do nothing to me. He's an awesome man of God. But once upon a time, I sat under another administration, and they used a John Bevere teaching called the bait of Satan to manipulate the congregation, to never, ever question any authority in any way, shape, or form, no matter what. And so, you know, there was an administration that used that to their advantage. You know what I'm saying? Never, ever question anything that the pastor says, ever. And I'm like, well, the, what the pastor's saying doesn't really line up with the Bible. Don't ever question it. The pastor, anyway, was it because I had this negative experience in my life when the guy said John Bevere? I'm like, no way. But how many of you know that the Lord oftentimes hides treasures and things that you don't want to deal with? He puts a piece of gold in somebody you can't stand. Blows me away. He's such a master. So I swallowed my pride and my hurtfulness, I took a, you know, the Lord was telling me when I, you know, he said, when you don't trust the church, and the church isn't just the people in this building, he said, when you don't trust the church, it says more about what you believe in me than what I believe in the church. And so this guy sent me this, and I had to, there was faith that was involved, and I had to take an action. I came to a crossroads. Am I going to believe that God can work through the church and take a chance and listen to this? even though I don't want to? Or am I going to take this opportunity to trust God? I took the opportunity to trust God. And I listened to the six hours of me wanting to pull my hair out. But let me tell you, there was so much awesomeness in there. And the Lord, through that teaching, showed me where I have manipulated, I have bent things, I have pushed directions, the Lord, that is probably one of the coolest things that the Lord showed me. Um, he showed me, in my opinion, he showed me, he said, you know, at the Nicene Council, uh, you had all these heavy hitters that showed up. You had, you, had, uh, you had Peter, you had Paul. I mean, you had the, the disciples, and they were trying to figure out, you know, what is, what is acceptable for the Gentiles. As, the, as Gentiles were being converted, uh, you know, I, <laughs> the Gentiles were being converted to this new religion. I don't want to say Judaism, um, because Jesus was involved, and they don't believe that. But anywho, Gentiles were being converted, and so you had Gentiles that were coming into synagogue, and the synagogue, the Jewish people, were not going to have the Gentiles, because the Gentiles didn't live the way that the Jewish people lived. They couldn't even sit in the same room with them. And so they were trying to figure out what they needed to do in order to make this work. And everybody threw out their own thoughts, their own opinions, but when it was all said and done, James had the final say. So you take the heaviest hitters, you take the biggest mega pastors, the most awesome people that you guys look up to, and they all get together, and they share what they think, but then one person makes the call. And once that one person makes the call, everybody throws their differences aside, and they all get in line, and they all follow that one leader. The Lord gave me that example. It rocked me. It rocked me. I didn't have any problems not having my way. I just had a problem following the leaders. It was all, it was, and then the Lord told me this. He said, you know, you don't even get an opportunity to submit is what he said, but I'll take it because of this and say surrender. You don't even get the opportunity to surrender until you have a disagreement. Because if everybody agrees all the time, how do you move, you know what I'm saying? Where's the submission in that? Where's the surrender in that? He said, you don't, God, he's so good, boy. Let me tell you what. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I highly recommend you get one. Because he has a way of telling me things that if my wife told me, we'd have problems. 
but he can tell me and it works. You can't even have the opportunity to surrender or submit until you have a disagreement. I'm way off. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. (laughs) I'm in Harrisonville, thanks. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 this whole, our Father frequently requires adjustments in areas of our lives that we never considered or even been open to in the past. I was never open to it. The Lord gave us a little prophetic word through this guy up at IHOP. You know what I'm saying? It caused me to think about things. He sends me an email. I try to trust the Lord in the area of correction that he's bringing me. The Lord rocks me, shows me all these areas of my heart. These are hidden sins. These are that whole song of songs. You know what I'm saying? The foxes, they kill the blossoms before the tree ever has a chance to fruit. You know what I'm saying? The Lord showed some hidden areas in my life, and as uncomfortable as it was, I had the opportunity to submit to him. And, it, and some awesome stuff happened from that day forward. And we're still in the process. But I'm, not, I'm not done by no stretch. So anyway, have you ever heard somebody say, don't ever tell God something that you don't want to do? Because that's exactly what he'll have you do. I mean, maybe you guys haven't heard that. If you haven't heard that, you're hearing it now. Don't ever tell God you're not going to do something. I used to tell God I'm never going to drive a Ford. Now i got a whole fleet of Fords. <laughs> those are inner vows. And when you make those kind of statements, whether inside or externally, you take the control out of the, out of the Father's hands. You've made yourself, you've elevated yourself to a place of lordship, and he ain't having it. He is not having it. So, uh... <clears throat> God's not looking for ways to make our lives difficult. However, he does intend to be the Lord of our life. He does. When we can identify a place where we refuse to allow his lordship, that is the place that the Lord is working. If you can identify within yourselves a place where you will not allow God to be the Lord, that's where he's working. That's where he's working. So... It's because he's seeking absolute surrender. You know, Jesus was the perfect model. The dude was accused of everything. He never even argued. <laughs> never even argued. I mean, even before, even before all the accusations happened, he went to the garden and he said, God, if there's another way, Dad, come on. You know what's crazy? Have you ever thought about this? This was the Son of God. Maybe there was a possibility that God would change his mind. If... If Jesus knew what his dad was thinking, why would he even ask? You know what I'm saying? God, if there's a way, Dad, if there's a way, can we do something different here, please? But nonetheless, your will. I surrender to your will. A lot of times our complete surrender is going to cause us and those around us a lot of turmoil. I know nobody wants to hear that, but think about it. Think about Jesus' mom, how much turmoil she went through to watch her son suffer because he was obedient. Wow. I don't know where it's at, but there's a story where, and and I know it's in the Bible. (laughs) It's in the Old Testament, or the New Testament. So uh, Paul's running around, and he goes to this dude's house named Jason, and he hangs out there, and then Paul leaves, and the authorities come and load looking for Paul, and they actually take Jason and throw him in jail. Because Paul was obedient to the Lord, those around him suffered. Nobody wants to think about that. I don't want to think about that. I don't want any of my friends or any of my family to suffer. But the times that we're in are pretty crazy. Who's to say somebody's not going to knock at your door, ask you a handful of questions, and based off the answers you give them, your family suffers? Puts things in perspective. He's seeking absolute surrender. Jesus says in Luke 14, 33, any of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Everything. I'm going to give you this little cool piece on the backside. Whatever you give to God, he usually takes it and gives it back so much better. That's the good part of it. It's kind of like investments. (laughs) You give it and you hope for the best, But he's the ultimate investment, you know. He always gives it back better. He never loses. The Lord asked me to give him my marriage, and I could not do it. He helped me. (laughs) He helped me give him my marriage, and he fixed it. 
and made it all better. Now my wife and I have an awesome marriage. I could have never dreamed that I would love somebody as much as I love her. I just want to be by her. I just want, her by, I just want to be in her presence. And even to be like that, I feel the Father in that. He's like, that's how I feel about you, son. I just want to be with you. Whatever you're doing, doesn't matter. Wherever you're going, I just want to be with you. <laughs> Again, Luke 14, this is Jesus. Jesus says this. Jesus says, any of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciple. What's your definition of everything? <laughs> everything. My time. I'm working on that. I used to be a crackhead. I'm not a crackhead no more. I went from crackheadness to drag racing. I used to drag race cars. It cost a small fortune. I was gone all the time, different drag strips all across the nation. I gave up that. I went to hunting. Can't even tell you the amount of money that I've thrown away on hunting gear. I know a guy that can. <laughs> Gasoline, hotels, different camouflage, tags for different states, traveling all over the place. I got away from hunting and went to fishing. That ain't much better. The fishing ain't much better. The boats, the fishing poles, the jigs, the gas, the broken motors, the <laughs> and uh, the Lord is slowly but surely getting me out of that. And now this is what I do. I spend all my time on Bible studies and praying and going here and making investments, I think, in kingdom purposes. You know what I'm saying? Trying to invest now in eternity as opposed to things that are, you know, moth-eaten and collecting rust. So Jesus also says in Luke 19, 23, 24, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must, must, Decide, deny themselves, take up their cross daily, daily, and follow him. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will save it. Have you given something up? Have you come to a place of absolute surrender? Have you surrendered an area of your life to God? If you do, he will give you life to fulfill that void. And it's one piece at a time. He's not asking you, it's no different. Listen, I went through some deliverance. It took years for me to renew my mind. I was delivered of some things, and if the Lord just ripped everything out of me all at one time, what would I be left with? I learned how to function out of manipulation. I learned how to be a rageaholic. I learned how to be an addict. I learned how to be lustful. I learned all of these things, and if he got them, if he just ripped it all out of me, what would I be left with? There would be no Scott left. I'm not putting limitations on the Father. He can do whatever he wants. He is sovereign. He can pull it all out and put something right back in. It took me a long time to understand that. You know, when a demon's kicked out of his home, he goes to the dry places seeking rest, and he doesn't find any. So he gets seven demons stronger than himself, and he returns back to the house and finds that it is swept clean, and all, they enter all. And, well, now you got the one demon plus seven more, and they all go back to the house, and the people are in worse thing. You know, they were worse off than they was originally. Because when you remove a demon out, when the Lord was taking lust and perversion and, and rage and hatred, when he was taking these things out of me, specifically, he did away with anger, hate, and rage and replaced them with peace, love, and joy. He pulled lust out of my life and he replaced it with purity. Now I get mad when I see ladies that are not dressed properly, when I used to be googly-eyed. Now I get frustrated because the enemy has duped them into believing that men are only interested in their physical appearance outside of their integrity and who they were really created to be. Hmm. We've got to remember that God is a good father we got to remember that his will is always best, and we got to remember that any adjustments that he is asking us to make is for our own good. For our own good. As uncomfortable as it may be, as uncomfortable as it, it, as it may be, he, he's got me in a thread right now as, uh, of, of objective truth. I have to take myself out of the way. My thoughts and my opinions don't necessarily matter. I might think that it's okay... I don't. I'm just using this for example. <laughs> I might think that it's okay to be gay because that's what the world says. But the Word of God says something different. 
And I have to stick on that truth, regardless of how it makes me feel. I have to. You know what I'm saying? Objective truth. His truth over my truth. Because my truth might not be in line with his truth. And I have to leave wiggle room to conform to his image. You know what I'm saying? Um. <laughs> we, aren't adjusting, we aren't adjusting our lives to a concept here. This, you know, this isn't a self-help group. <laughs> We're not adjusting our lives. We're not, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm telling you guys, based out of an intimate relationship with God the Father, with, with first Jesus Christ, first Jesus Christ ultimately leading to God the Father. You know what I'm saying? Last week was, a mirror, or last week was amazing. We've seen some cool stuff last week, okay? But we can't get sidetracked with that. We've got to understand that miracles are only a byproduct of our intimate relationship with God. That didn't happen outside of intimate relationship. That was just a byproduct. When we chase that stuff... And forget the relationship, it doesn't work. It, it's called idol worship. Okay? And that stuff happens, that, 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 the stuff that happened last, the cool stuff that happened last week, that was collective. That was collective. That was you making good decisions, you making the good decisions, you making good decisions, you submitting to the Father there, you repenting here, you asking the Lord for help here. It was everybody in one mind and one accord that awesome stuff happens. We're not adjusting our lives to a concept. We're aligning our lives to God, our Father. We alter our viewpoints to resemble His, and we change our ways to be like His. All year long, I can't get away from Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, you know? His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than ways. I'm paraphrasing. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He keeps showing me his thoughts and his ways, and I'm like, well, that ain't what I was taught. And he goes, I didn't ask you what you was taught. What's my word say? And I'm like, oh, whoa, objective truth. I better make this right here my plumb line instead of what I thought I knew. Um, it's, it's awesome. It's not bad. It's amazing. I'm telling you, it's so freeing. It is so freeing. Oh, man. This was tricky. The Lord... You know, you know, <laughs> you, you want to roll off your notes and the Lord's like, okay, that's great. That's awesome. Now let's, I want you to talk about this. I'm like, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. That's my private stuff. Why can't we talk about that? <laughs> and he goes, because other people struggle with the same thing you do. And we're set free by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so when you sprinkle a little struggle in there, Somebody else goes, I've struggled with that. You know, I've been there before, and this, this could help you out. Or, I'm dealing with that right now. I can't stand leadership. <laughs> I can't stand people telling me what to do. You know, that's how we are in America. We're the land of the free and the home of the brave. We are the independents. That's not how God made the kingdom. God made the kingdom to be interdependent. I have to rely on you and your skills. I can't just rely on mine. And we, the world we live in is I rely on me. My four and no more is what I used to call it. My family, my, my, you know, my, me, my four and no more. Y'all will get your own. You worry about your own thing. And that's not how I see it in the book of Acts. You know what I'm saying? They got rid of everything and they put, put all their resources together. You have a skill, I don't. I have a skill, you don't. You have a skill, he don't. He has a skill, she don't. She has a skill. That, and when you put it all together, there's no lack. So with that being said, if you guys could please bow your heads. You don't have to if you want to. Just always wanted to say that because I've seen it on TV. <laughs> if, you <guys> could <laughs> if you guys could bow your heads and close your eyes. Uh, is God asking you to make some adjustments? Is he asking you to position yourself to work with him in advancing his kingdom. Just think about that. Is God asking you to make some adjustments, to position yourself to work with him in advancing his kingdom? Is there an area in your life where God is asking you to completely surrender to him? Again, is God asking you to completely surrender a particular area of your life to him? 
Listen, is he asking you to surrender a job, your finances? Is he asking you to surrender your thoughts to him, your attitude, my attitude? Is he asking you to surrender a loved one? Is he asking you to surrender family members, your family as a whole? Is he asking you to surrender your actions, your beliefs, your circumstances? What is God asking you to surrender? Because I'm telling you, he's asking us all to surrender something. And it's not going to be the same for all of us, but none of us are in heaven yet. What is he asking you to surrender? Is he asking you to surrender your life to him? Is he asking you to surrender your soul to him? Father God, I just thank you today. I thank you for giving me the things that you've given me. I thank you for the experiences that you allow all of us to go through, Heavenly Father, as a way to make us better, as a way to conform us into your image, as a way to help our brothers and sisters around us. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bring to our minds, bring to our thoughts the areas in our lives individually that you would have us to surrender to you. And Lord, I ask for courage, courage for each one of my brothers and sisters to be able to faithfully lay that down at the foot of the cross. And not only lay it down, Lord, but to help us not pick it up. When we lay it down at the foot of the cross, that we would not pick it up again, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful for you. Jesus, thank you for choosing to die on our behalf. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you for bridging the gap between us and God. God, thank you for sending your son to atone for our sins. Thank you for giving us your word, Father, that it washes us clean. Thank you for continually working on us and never giving up. But you never give up. Lord, help us to never give up. Lord, help us. Help us. Lord, I repent for the areas in my life that I don't trust you with. I repent, Father. Help my unbelief. Father, I ask that you would build up our faith. I thank you for carrying us when we can't walk. I thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. I thank you for loving us when we can't love ourselves. Lord, you're a gracious, good, good Father. Help us to wholeheartedly surrender to you, your ways, your plans, your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody needs prayer,